It's my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Clee Irwin, CEO of Irwin Naturals. Come on over, Clee. Give him a round of applause, please. Thank you. Thank you. So this talk is about brand and what brand uh, can bring to the disruptive emerging space of psychedelics. Um, but to tell you a little bit about my life path towards psychedelics, we started 28 years ago in 1994. And by 1999, we had become a household uh, name in America. We're known by something in the range of 80% of US households. And our uh, nutraceutical products are sold in uh, pretty much every outlet in America that would sell such products, you know, Costco, Walmart, Whole Foods. And um, then in 2010, I got into philanthropy and um, have dedicated a lot of time into fundamental science, a nonprofit uh, institute that I founded called Quantum Gravity Research, where we work on um, fundamental physics, the unification of general relativity and quantum mechanics with an emphasis on the measurement problem, which relates to how consciousness has an enigmatic and bizarre relationship with the physical universe around us. In, uh, in quantum mechanics, when you observe a physical system, it behaves differently. So if you have knowledge and awareness of the system you're observing, the very physics seems to react as though it knows that it's being observed. And then uh, decades of successful product launches, um, a strange anomaly in consumer packaged goods, uh, we have 28 consecutive years of profitability. I really um, am very averse to losing money, even if it takes money to make money, I don't like that idea of a burn rate. So we usually grow and dominate in our categories while maintaining profitability. And then in 2018, we entered into the mushroom space. And in 2019, we entered into the cannabis space by dipping our toe in the water with the less controversial cannabinoid CBD. And over the last couple of years, we became the world's largest seller of CBD in the mass market. Um, in terms of doses, users, mind share. Um, and then this year, we are extending our brand into uh, psychedelics and into um, THC. For our psychedelic business, it's the brand at the patient interface. So that would be the clinic brand. So we intend to be the world's first truly household name brand with a national and then international footprint of clinics. Um, and our five pillars uh, would be psychedelics, starting with the uh, only legal psychedelic, ketamine, but moving into um, other psychedelics where legally allowed. And then TMS, stellate ganglia block, uh, holotropic breath work, and uh, group talk therapy, group uh, integration. So we want to take an integrative approach so that we can push the upper limits in the 90 percentile direction in terms of patient success rates, and then eventually bring those white papers and that data to the big third-party payers and try to compel them to pay early because as for-profit businesses, they will chase the money. And if it saves them money from having to pay a $600 psychiatric visit and a lifetime prescription to Welbutrin, if they can get more early stage healing for a patient and it makes money for them, then they will do that. So we'll try to convince them of that. 
So there's a problem, and that is that trauma and mental illness map to income, and insurance isn't yet covering uh, off-label ketamine treatment. And uh, so what do you do about that? Well, the solution is to use the power of brand to drive down patient costs. And so the rest of this presentation will make the argument of how brand comes into play. And at the end of the day, we do not buy products. We do not buy services. We buy brands. And so there will be two brand classes in this disruptive mega industry of psychedelic mental health that we are at the dawn of now. The first are the major drug brands, such as Bravado and all of the many other drug brands that will be coming on the scene. And the second are the major national clinic chain brands that employ the doctors that the pharmaceutical companies must go through to get their drugs into the hands of patients. Now, building a household name brand is very expensive, and it takes decades of presence in the market. But once a household name brand is established, operating costs can go down precipitously. And if operating costs go down at the clinic brand level in this vertical integration stack of our industry, then those operating savings automatically get passed down to patients and the third party payers. So accessibility increases. So the good thing for us is with 28 years of building our brand, we have about 80% of households know this brand and they like this brand. You know, we have rate ratings of 4.6 on five star rating systems. So it's got a pretty good uh, trust factor. So the hardest part, the most expensive part at least, is already done in our case. And all that awaits us is the execution of our national roll up of profitable psychedelic mental health clinics. Now, our market cap right now, these are the tools that we have to do the roll up. So we have a billion dollar market cap. We've got this 28 year run rate of profitability. We've got very low, you know, good looking balance sheet, you know, debt to total assets of only 6.9%, no options outstanding, super vested management, 90% management owned. So what we have with this roll-up play to become the world's largest and first truly global or national footprint um, of these of mental health clinics that the drug companies will go through is we have a rare Coca-Cola first mover advantage. Now these first mover advantages don't show up very often in mega industries at least. And we have that now. So two quick um, hero studies is there was a Coca-Cola first mover advantage that was uh, up for grabs many years ago. So there was this year where um, VCRs were not yet popular. They just come out. But people knew that we were going to get up to 90% of American households with VCRs in just a few years. So Wayne Azenga and the people at Blockbuster Video wanted to seize the opportunity, make that Coca-Cola first mover play. But in order to get a national footprint overnight to eclipse the competition from having a fighting chance at, being, at, at, at getting that, that first mover advantage, they couldn't just organically open blockbuster video locations. So what they did is they targeted good mom and pop video rental stores, and they began a roll up. So they began acquiring them at a very fast pace. And of course, they would just put their POS system in place and uh, put a new sign in front, Blockbuster Video. So that gave them their national footprint that allowed them, once they could come up for air, 
uh, to start opening up new leases and organically opened blockbusters. And of course, nobody ever came close to blockbuster. And then the other example in a more clinic oriented case is Jenny Craig. She realized that there were these um, clinics in New York and Los Angeles and celebrities were going to these clinics just simply learning how to eat right and exercise and avoid cardiovascular disease. And she thought, well, the people suffering most from these diseases are the people in the middle of the country, but they're the ones who can't afford these expensive clinics. So she was able to convince investors that if they would bankroll her to create this household name and carpet America with these clinics, that uh, there would not that, that that they would have executed a Coca-Cola first mover advantage, making it difficult for anybody to overtake them. And of course, she pulled that off. They got up to 700 clinics, and um, and it's a household name. But in both the Blockbuster video and the Jenny Craig examples, they had to spend billions of dollars in advertising money over a period of years to eventually become a household name. So our advantage here again is that we have this household name, it's already in health and wellness, we can extend it outwards in scope to include uh, mental health. So how big is this opportunity, this roll up? How big is this opportunity in this industry? Well, the way I look at it is 25% of adults and rising have a diagnosable mental illness, whether that's sleeplessness, anxiety, subclinical PTSD, depression, anxiety, you name it, there's a massive percentage of us who could benefit from impactful treatments. Now there's 179,000 dental clinics in America. Why that many? Because a lot of people go to the dentist, but not all people go to the dentist once a year, and we still need 179,000 just to take care of the people who go to the dentist. And so if you think about the number of us Americans who have the opportunity to have a breakthrough treatment from the coming wave of transformation in this sea change that is the psychedelic renaissance, we need a heck of a lot more than the 600 ketamine clinics. So of course, all of these ketamine clinics will be using the new psilocybin-based and MDA, uh, MDMA-based drugs that are going to be coming out. But we need a heck of a lot more than 600 of them to serve 25% of the population. So we're at the very, very beginning of a rapid expansion of the quantity of these psychedelic mental health clinics in this country. 600 is just scratching the surface relative to the need. So one of the things that we plan to do early in this roll up is we're gonna get high level meetings with executives at Anthem. And we're gonna get high level meetings with executives at Johnson & Johnson, as well as the psychedelic uh, drug companies in attendance uh, at this uh, conference. And we want to do that because we want to get to know them quickly and we want them to stay tuned to our channel so that as we accelerate the pace of the roll-up that we're doing, for example, yesterday we put out a press release of um, a closure of an acquisition of a six uh, clinic chain. And we have a hundred clinics that we've been talking to. And we're not getting any, we're not getting very many hard no's. Um, we, have, we have something unusual compared to what they've seen from other uh, people who may have spoken to them about acquisitions. Um, and that is that regardless of any bearish period where the psychedelic stocks are, you know, not being favored in the market, our company really can't fully collapse down to a penny stock the way some of the 
uh, smaller psychedelic public stocks have because we're not a burn rate company. We don't really even need public money to execute um, our growth strategy. For example, we're extending our uh, Irwin Naturals brand into cannabis. Uh, right now, cannabis is on the eve of federal legalization, and we're already at 38 states in the country who have legalized cannabis. Um, but there are no brands in the space, and that's because it's not federally legal. So the brands are popular in a given state, but if you go to the state next door, nobody's heard of that particular cannabis brand. And so Irwin Naturals with this 80% household name recognition will end up being this uh, largest, um, first of the large brands in, in cannabis. But we're, we, in, we are intending to uplist to a major US exchange soon. And so we can't touch plant. For example, NASDAQ won't let you list on their exchange if you're plant touching, which is perfect for us because with our cannabis uh, model, all we care about is getting an Irwin Naturals bottle of power to sleep with THC in a dispensary shelf in Michigan, New Jersey, California. Um, and the consumer doesn't really care whether it's done by a licensing structure where we've licensed a plant toucher. So the point in licensing and cash flow is that it, to execute our land grab to become the first brand, first national brand in THC, uh, we simply don't need money. They're just licensing contracts. Um, we don't need CapEx costs to go into a state and set up a uh, shop. And we've been growing for a quarter of a century, we've been growing our uh, CPG business in the big chain stores like Costco for, you know, profitably for, for as long as we've been in business. So we don't need money for that either for public markets. And with the roll up of the ketamine clinics, we, um, we're doing that with stock. And so we don't need cash for that either. So what we'll use the cash for is um, more advertising. Uh, maybe we can accelerate the clinic rollout by giving cash sweeteners to some of the uh, clinic partners who are joining our family in the rollout. Um, but essentially, um, we're a bit of an anomaly in some of these ways, you know, sort of anomalous in that we're an old company and we have a very famous brand. Um, we're anomalous in terms of our profitability. Um, and at the end of the day, I'm coming at all of this as, um, as a philanthropist um, who's exploiting capitalism in a sort of B Corp mentality to, to think, how can I exploit this famous brand that I've built up over most of my adult life in order to do good in the world. And if it makes investors money, if it makes me money, that's, that's a side effect. But the doing good is the first and foremost part. And uh, the mental health crisis is the scariest thing. It's, it's more scary to me than the chance of nuclear holocaust. It's, it's scary. And uh, so I think that by helping to accelerate the validation and the, um, the mainstreaming of the psychedelic renaissance, having a household name brand come into the space, it does help to validate, but at the end of the day, I want to leverage brand to drive patient accessibility because this is one of the rare disease states that does track to income. And so we need to take care of the people in our society who are suffering the most and, um, and, you, and leveraging brand is the way to do it. So thank you. Thank you, thank you, Clee. Much appreciated, my friend. I'll take this. Thank you very much.